In this video, we'll be animating this robot arm in Blender. You'll find the robot arm file on my website here. Link is in the description. Check out my character and asset rigging courses on Udemy for more detailed training. Check out the description for a great price on courses. Rigs are made up of a series of interconnected joints known as a hierarchical chain, which defines the range of motion of the 3D model. These joints are controlled using a system of controls and allows animators manipulate the model to create performances. This model is color coded with each part that will bind to a bone a unique color. Let's come to the add menu and down to armature and we can add a single bone. The armature object as we can see in the outliner is a container or framework and a hierarchical structure containing the bones. So expanding the armature object exposes the armature and then the bone object inside. The bone itself is made up of two components, joints, the head and the tail. If we tab into edit mode, we'll see that a bit clearer up here in the transform properties. Shortcut N. So you have the location of the head in the XYZ and the location of the tail with properties for its roll, length and envelope. The connecting section between the head and the tail is a visual and we can come to the object data properties tab. Expand the viewport display. Here you can change the display type. So for example, we could have a stick. Can be less intrusive, but more difficult to tell the head from the tail. Let's set this back to the default. We can check on in front and that makes the armature overlay other objects in the scene. You can also check on show names and axes. These can be useful aids when learning to rig. When translating the bone, you should do so in edit mode. Try avoiding scaling, moving or rotating the armature in object mode. The next mode available for the armature is pose mode. This is where you can manipulate bones of an armature when posing or animating the character. Pose mode is used after the rigging and binding process, so we'll look at this later. Let's start and rig up this arm so let's come into a front view first and we can make sure we're in an orthographic view with this button here. Let's select the bone and this will be the root bone. Let's press R, input minus 90 and enter. Let's use snapping to snap the bone to the base of the arm and its origin. Incidentally, the origin point of this arm is at center on the bottom of the base, which is also world zero. Generally, you will want the origin of a character or acid at its base and the same position of the armature. We can snap the bone to the base. So first, if we press shift plus S, we can put the cursor to world origin. Then press shift plus S and choose selection to cursor. That snaps the head of the bone to that position. If we come to the tool shelf, we can switch on the move tool. That way we can just drag the tail back and reduce the bone in size. Let's add the next bone in the chain. This will be used to control this lower arm section. Let's actually press the forward slash key to isolate this armature so we can see how the bone gets added. There are a couple of ways you can create the next bone in the chain. The first is with the head selected, press shift plus A and create one this way. That will create a bone from the head of the root bone. Another way if I delete this bone again, with the head selected, press E to extrude, press Z and restrict this to the Z axis. Another way to create a bone is to duplicate an existing one. We can press X and delete this bone. Select the root bone and press Shift plus D and right click to cancel movement. Press G, Z and drag up a little. Let's press the forward slash key and return to global view. This remains center of the base and away from the root bone. We can grab the tail and drag back. Press control and snap to the outside of the base. One distinction to make between these bones is that this new bone will be a deformed bone, whereas the root bone will not. It's an important distinction as deformed bones are the ones you bind to vertices and directly deform the mesh, whereas bones such as the root bone do not deform. The root bone is a reference point for the entire armature, the first in the hierarchy and doesn't directly deform any vertices. If we open the bone properties tab here, we can see the deform checkbox is on for this new bone. It's on by default for all new bones. If we select the root bone, we can uncheck the form. 
As we added each bone, Blender adds a suffix .001, so each name is unique. That's helpful, but you'll usually need more descriptive names, especially when binding the joints to the vertices. Knowing exactly where each bone is located and what vertices to bind to is important. If you select the root bone, we can press F2. That brings up the name field and the bone can be renamed from here. If we right click to cancel, you can also open the bone properties tab. Here you also have the name field, so let's rename this root. The next bone we can rename to base. It's important name bones and to have a consistent naming convention throughout your rigs. That way when you pass off your rigs to animators or even when animating yourself, the names make sense. Let's come back into a front view. We can select the head of the base bone. Press E, Z and drag this up. Let's rotate around in the scene. One thing you need to keep an eye on when adding bones is the bone orientation. When we extruded, this base bone maintains the root bone orientation. If I press G and just drag this away, you can see the axis icon and the Z axis are pointing in the same direction. And that's what we want as we're adding new bones. We're looking for consistency in each bone orientation. The next thing we need to do is get this tail of the bone into the correct position. So this next section of arm will be pivoting from the center. So what we need to do is find that point on the model and snap this tail to that position. To do that, let's tab back to object mode and we can select this model. Now tab in here. The easiest way to do this is by selecting a center vertex or in this case a face. So let's switch to face select. Select the center face and we can say that's approximately center of this round here. This will be the pivot point from where this arm section rotates. So let's press shift plus s and put the cursor to select it. We also need to move the cursor back so it's aligned with the bone. And we can quite easily do that as the bone is at zero on the Y axis. So let's open the view tab. Here we have the cursor location and all we need to do now is in the Y field input zero. That moves this back center. So if we just come into a top view we can see that yes it's aligned with the bone. So let's tab back to object mode. We can select the armature and tab in here. Let's come into a front view. Press G and drag the tail close to the cursor. Now press Shift plus S and choose Selection to Cursor. That moves the head into the correct position and what will be the rotation point for this next section of arm. Now we need the placement position for the next joint. So let's tab back to Object Mode. Select the model and tab in here. Let's zoom in close here. We can Alt select this edge of faces here. Press Shift plus S and put the cursor to selected. Similar to before, we need this at zero on the Y axis and aligned with our armature. In the Y location field, let's input zero. Now we can tab back to object mode. Select the armature and let's tab in here. Let's come into a front view as it's easier to see where the bone is placed. We can press E to extrude. Press X to restrict it to the X axis and we can left click and just place that here. Press G and drag up close. Then we can snap this into position. Let's select the bone. Press F2 and rename this lower arm. The previous bone base.001 is fine named as this as we won't be binding this to any vertices. It's just a visual for the bone hierarchy. We can continue placing these joints so let's tab back to object mode and we can select the model again. Now tab in here. Sometimes you'll come across areas like this where there's no definite center point. In situations like this we will try get it exact as possible and where we determine it to be. Here we can add a circle and get an approximation. So let's come into a front view. We can also press Z and switch to wireframe. Select the space here. Shift plus S and put the cursor to select it. Then from the add menu, let's add a circle. In the properties box below here, click and drag to reduce the radius and bring this in to about what we are expecting here. In the X rotation field, let's input 90 and face this forward. Then adjust the radius to better match the size. 
Use the X and Z location fields to move the circle to the correct position. This looks like a good match right now. So let's press Shift plus S and choose Cursor to Selected. In the View menu, in the Y location field, let's input 0. We are finished with the circle, so press X and delete vertices. Let's tab back now and we can select the armature. Now tab in here. With this joint selected, let's press E to extrude. X to restrict it to the X axis and place that here. Press Shift plus S and choose Selection to Cursor. Let's select it and press F2 and we can rename this upper underscore arm. We can tab back to object mode and select the model again. Now let's tab back in here. For this joint, this vertex here will be the rotation point. Press Shift plus S and put the cursor to selected. We can switch back to solid shading. In the view tab, if we look at the location Y, this should be zero. So update that if it's not exact. So now let's tab back and we can select the armature again. Select this joint. Press E, Y and drag this forward. Press Shift plus S and put selection to cursor. Select it now and press F2. We can rename this forward arm. Now we need the next bone in this chain so let's tab back to object mode. We can select the model and tab in here. We really just need to place this close to the top so let's alt select this edge loop here. Press Shift plus S and put the cursor to select it. Now we can tab back and select the armature. Now tab in here. Come into a front view. Press E, X and just drag this forward. Press Shift plus S and choose Selection to Cursor. Let's rename this head. Let's come over to the Bone Properties tab. Here we can see the parent bone is the forward arm. We can also see that the check mark connected is enabled. This means that it's directly linked to its parent bone. So when the parent bone is moved or rotated, the bone will follow along. However, when connected, it cannot move independently. When this is disabled, the bone can be moved independently, but it does remain a child. The next two bones in this chain will control the forks and will be disconnected. So let's look at creating these two bones. Let's come into a top view. We can press E, X and drag away here. If we select this bone and press G, it's going to remain connected to its parent bone. So we can right click. Over in the relations area, let's uncheck connected. That way we can press G and this will move independently. So let's tab back to object mode and select the model and tab in here. We want to place this at the back of the fork here. So let's switch to wireframe shading. We can select the back four vertices of this rectangle shape here. Press Shift plus S and put the cursor to selected. Now let's tab back to object mode and select the armature. Now tab in here. With this bone selected, let's press Shift plus S and choose selection to cursor. We can rename this bone, so press F2 and rename this fork underscore R to indicate this is the right side bone. Let's make a duplicate, so press Shift plus D and move this over here. We need to get the snap point, so tab back and select the model and tab in here. Select the vertices on the opposite side. Press Shift plus S and put the cursor to selected. Now tab back and select the armature and tab in here. Select the bone and press Shift plus S and put selection to cursor. Press F2 and rename this fork underscore L. You'll also notice it keeps the parenting hierarchy with the head bone. This next step can be known as skinning, weight painting or binding and it's the process of associating the vertices, edges and faces of an object with the control objects. In this case the armature and the individual bones. Each vertex is assigned a weight for a particular bone and how much influence the bone will have over that vertex. It's a form of parenting and once each bone is bound will deform a section of the mesh. So the base bone will control this base section here once the vertices are assigned and then each section up along will be controlled by the assigned bones. Before we move on to that process let's first make sure the parenting hierarchy is correct on our rig. So we can begin with the root bone. 
In the Relations tab, this parent field is empty as it is the root bone and the first in the chain. The form is also unchecked. Select the base bone. Here we need to make sure the root bone is the parent. Also, the form is checked on. We can quickly select each bone and make sure the previous bone is the parent bone. These look good, so let's tab back to Object Mode. If we select the armature first, then drag select all objects. The armature will remain the active object and the lighter colour. We use the parenting menu, so we can press Ctrl plus P, and from here we can set parent to armature to form and choose with empty groups. This will create vertex groups on the mesh, each named after a bone in the armature. These are empty groups, so no influence has been assigned to the vertices. We will assign the influence manually and it's a common approach when binding mechanical objects. Right now, if we select the armature itself and press G, the entire object moves along so we know the object is parented to the armature. We can right click to cancel. Now, if we select the mesh object, we can go to the object data properties tab. Here, you will see a list of vertex groups with the same names as the bones in your armature. These vertex groups are empty meaning they have no vertex weighting assigned yet, but we can do that manually now. So let's tab into edit mode. The first thing we can do is press Alt plus A and deselect any vertices. We don't want any vertices assigned to the wrong bone. You'll notice when in edit mode, we'll get a few additional buttons under the vertex group area. The first one is to assign the selected vertices to the selected group. The second is to remove any vertices from a group. Then you can select the vertices of individual groups or deselect them. Beneath this is the weight value. So how much bone weight are you assigning the selected vertices? Let's begin with the base bone. With it selected, let's come into the scene and we can hover on parts of the base object and press L to select them. We can also maybe press shift and drag select this section here with the individual nuts and bolts. Then press Ctrl plus L to select linked and make sure all of these are selected. If we press G, we can see this whole object moves away as one. So with that, we can come over and click assign. This assigns the vertices to the base bone with a weight of one. So to check the selected vertices are fully weighted, we can first tab back to object mode, select the armature and then from the mode menu, let's switch into pose mode. Pose mode is a mode used for working with armatures and posing rigged characters or objects. It allows you to manipulate bones in the armature to create different poses, animate the character and control deformations of the mesh. In pose mode, you can move, rotate and scale the bones of an armature, create keyframes for animation and use various constraints and drivers to control the bones behaviors. If we select the base bone in here, Press R, Z, this bone will rotate the vertices we assigned. So the entire base of the object will rotate, scale or move along with the bone. We can move on, so let's press Ctrl plus Tab and come back to Object Mode. We can select the model again and tab in here. With these vertices still selected, let's press H and hide them and make it easier focus on the remaining we need to bind. Let's come into a top view. We can also switch to wireframe shading. Let's drag select this section here. Then press Ctrl plus L to make sure all connected vertices are selected. We can rotate back around here and also press Z and come back to solid shading. So if we press G, this section of R moves as one and we can be sure it's all selected. So in the vertex groups, let's select the lower arm group then we can click and assign the selected vertices to this bone. Let's press H to hide that set of vertices. For the next bone, we have these two pieces of mesh here. So let's hover the cursor and press L to select both these pieces. Then if we select the upper arm bone, we can click and assign these vertices. Press H and hide this selection. For the next one, let's again press L to select this. We can then select the forward arm and click assign. We can repeat this for the next section, so press L to select all of this. We can also select this small piece out in front. This will need to move with the head bone as the two front bones will move horizontally. Now select the head bone and we can assign these vertices. Now press H to hide. 
That leaves fork R and fork L, so let's hover on the vertices of fork L and select these. Select fork L group and assign these vertices. Press H to hide this. Let's quickly repeat that for fork L and we can assign these vertices. Then press H to hide this. So once all your vertices are hidden, you can be sure they have been assigned to some bone in the armature. You can press Alt plus H to unhide all the vertices. Now let's tab back to object mode. If we select the armature, we can press Ctrl plus tab and come back into pose mode. On the tool shelf, we can switch on the rotation gizmo. That way you can test each of the bones are controlling the assigned vertices. After you rotate the bones and need to reset to their default orientations, first press A to select them all. Then press Alt plus R to reset rotation, Alt plus S to reset the scale, and Alt plus G will reset any translation. If we select the base bone, we can test rotation. We can open the sidebar and the item tab. In the Z rotation, we can click and drag to rotate the base bone around the Z axis. This shouldn't be rotating around the X, so there is obviously an issue with the bone roll, so let's tab into edit mode. Here in the roll field, this is minus 90, so let's reset this to zero. We can tab back now. Let's click and drag in the field now. This works as expected now. And because this is the only axis we need to rotate this bone around, what we can do is use the lock icon and lock all other fields, including the location, as this will avoid accidentally moving the bone out of position. Lock the scale fields also. So let's lock all of these except for the Z rotation. So that way, if we select the rotation gizmo, only the Z axis is available. Also, if you press R, it will only ever rotate on the Z axis. Now you can overwrite that by clicking and dragging in the fields here, but this is a good way to restrict it to a certain axis. The next bone, base.001, we don't want to have the ability to move, rotate or scale at all. So we can click the lock icon and lock all location, rotation and scale transforms here. We can move up along the chain to the next bone. This will rotate around the Z axis, so every other bone can be locked. So if you press R to rotate, it's ever only going to rotate on this axis. Same thing with the next one. We can lock all of these except for the Z axis. So when you press R, these are only going to rotate around the correct axis. We can continue and lock the rest up to the forward arm. The head and fork bones will be a little bit different. So for the fork bones, we can switch to the move tool. And up top in the transform orientation dropdown, let's switch this to local. So we just want these to move in and out along the Z axis. So every other field here can be locked. So that way, if we press G, it's ever only going to move across on the Z axis. We can do the same thing for the second bone here and lock all other axes except for the Z location field. After we locked the transform fields, we just need to press G and move these forks in and out. While this is useful, wouldn't it be better if we could limit the range somehow? Well, that's where constraints come in. Constraints are a powerful feature that allows you control and limit the movement, rotation or scaling of objects, bones or other elements. In the case of the forks here, we can use the limit location constraint. This constraint limits the location of an object within a specified range on one or more axes. To add one, let's open the Bone Constraints Properties tab here. It's easy to get confused with the Object Constraints tab, but this will apply the constraint to the entire object and not the individual bone. So from the Constraints dropdown, we can choose a limit location. We only want to affect the Z axis, so put a check mark to enable both these fields. This is also set to world space, so let's switch this to local space. In Blender, you will often encounter these two coordinate systems, local space and global space. Understanding the difference between these two is crucial for rigging and animation. Global space refers to the coordinate system of the overall scene in Blender. When you move, rotate or scale an object in global space, you are changing its properties based on the world coordinate system. Local space is specific to each individual object or bone. 
It represents the coordinate system relative to the object or bone's origin and orientation. When you move, rotate or scale an object in local space, you are changing its properties based on its own coordinate system. Here, local space allows us manipulate the bone based on its own local orientations. So the values we enter here will be relative to the bone's own location and rotation coordinates. Let's just disable the limit location constraint for a moment and we can see this visually. Right now, the minimum we want this to move the bone across is zero. So we don't need it to go beyond its starting position here on the negative Z. If we select the move gizmo and move this to center, we don't want to move beyond center, which in this case will be 31 on the positive Z. So let's input 31 in the maximum Z field. I tried this earlier, so I do know 31 works. We can switch this back on. So if we drag this manipulator now, it's limited between 0 and 31 on the Z axis. We can do the same thing for the second bone, so let's add a limit location constraint. We can enable the Z maximum and minimum. Switch this to local space. This time the minimum will want to be minus 30 because we're moving into the negative X direction. The maximum can remain at 0. So now, if we press G to move, each one is constrained between the minimum and maximum values. Let's look at the head bone next. First, we can press A to select them all. Press Alt plus R, Alt plus S and Alt plus G to clear out any transforms. Let's come into a top view. Select the head bone. We can add a limit rotation constraint here. Now before we enable any of the axes in the transform X field, let's click and drag and see how much we want to rotate this. So about minus 0.6 looks good here. And if we move this forward, maybe 0.6. So let's right click and bring this back to rest. Let's enable limit X, limit Y and limit Z. We can switch this to local space. So in the minimum X, let's input minus 60 and in the max input 60. We can repeat that for the Y and Z using the same values. So in the minimum we can input minus 60 and in the max input 60. We can do that for both these axes. Why not work along and add a constraint to the remaining bones and constrain the movement along the X axis and I can speed this up. The next stage to the rigging process are to add rig controls. These are user friendly controls to facilitate the animation workflow. So rather than having these large chunky bones, we can add smaller, less intrusive shapes in their place. Now you can go into great detail and create some unique shapes, but for this example, we'll just keep it simple and use a circle. So let's press Ctrl plus Tab and come back to Object Mode. We can press Shift plus S and put the cursor to World Origin. Then from the Add menu in Mesh, let's add a circle. We can press F2 and rename this shape underscore control. Now we need to select the rig again. Press Ctrl plus Tab and come back into pose mode. Let's begin with the root bone. Open the bone properties tab and come down to viewport display and expand this. In the custom object field, we can click the drop down and choose our shape control object. This shape replaces the root bone in the scene. The rotation is at 90, so we can input 90 in the Y rotation field here. This scale to bone length scales the circle to the length of the bone, and that works well here. Let's move on to the base bone. We can do exactly the same thing and choose the shape control object. The defaults work well here, so let's leave those. Let's select the head bone next. Then from custom shape, let's choose the shape control object. This time, however, in the X rotation field, we can input 90 and rotate this around. Click into the XYZ scale and we can reduce this to 0.5 and have this a little bit smaller. So you can see how straightforward it can be to add custom shapes as rig controls to the armature. So if we select the head control and just double tap R, this gives us the full control we had with the bone, except it's not intrusive. So why not work along and add shapes to the remaining bones in the rig and I can speed this up. Let's switch into the animation tab up top here. We can zoom in to the model. In the outliner, let's hide the visibility of the shape control object. In the object data properties tab, let's uncheck axes. 
We can also uncheck NIM so we have less clutter in the viewport. The Animation tab is a dedicated workspace for the animation process. It provides a pre-arranged layout of editors for creating, editing and previewing animations. On the top right is the 3D view. Below this is the Timeline Editor. The controls can be used for navigating and setting keyframes during the animation process. Above this is the Dope Sheet. This provides a visual representation of keyframes and their timing and allows you edit and adjust keyframes easily. With the cursor in the Dope Sheet, if you press Ctrl plus Tab, this toggles you into the Graph Editor. The Graph Editor displays and allows you edit animation curves for more precise control over object properties and interpolation. Let's press Ctrl plus Tab and switch back to the Dope Sheet. Then there is the Properties Editor and the Outliner. We also have a second 3D view here with some of the scene overlays switched off. Let's open the Object Data tab for a moment. Here we have the bone layers and we can move this bone base.001 to a hidden layer. So in the scene press M and we can move this to the layer beneath as we won't be needing it. So let's begin and press A to select all the controls. Click the Jump to Endpoint button and just make sure the scrubber is back at frame 1. Then we can press I and add a location rotation keyframe for all of these bones at this point in time. Now when animating I usually like to check on auto keying here. Auto keying is a feature that automatically creates keyframes for bones when their properties such as location, rotation or scale are changed during the animation process. This can significantly speed up the animation workflow as you do not need to manually insert keyframes each time you move or rotate a bone. Let's drag the scrubber onto frame 48 which is 2 seconds. 2 seconds as the default frame rate in a blender scene is 24 frames per second. We can select the base control. Then on the sidebar, in the Z rotation field, let's rotate this around. So maybe 3.4. Now you'll notice because we have auto keying enabled, new keyframes were added with the change in the control rotation property. So if we drag back and forth along the timeline, the arm will rotate back and forth between those two keyframes. Let's select the upper arm control. In the X rotation field, let's click and drag and rotate this to about minus 2.4. Next, let's select the lower arm. In the X rotation field, we can drag this forward. So maybe 3.3. .3. Let's drag the scrubber onto frame 96, which is 4 seconds. Also, let's come into a front view. We can select the head next. I'm just going to double tap R and rotate this around a little bit until it comes down to the ground. Let's drag the scrubber back to frame 80. Then we can select each of the forks, press I and add a location rotation keyframe here. Do this for both. We need both open at this stage. Then if we drag on to 96, we can press G and drag these in and until they're closed. Then let's click into the current frame field behind 96. We can add a plus and add 10 and press return. That adds 10 frames to the current frame. We can press A to select all the bones. Press I and add a location keyframe to store the values at this point in time. So in the current frame field, let's click at the back of 106. Then if we add a plus, we can input 48. That will add to 106 seconds and bring us up to frame 154. So we can press A to select everything. Press Alt plus R, Alt plus G to clear out all those transformations. Let's press Ctrl plus End to bring up the timeline. Then press the spacebar to play the animation.